graphic depictions. This is beyond, moving beyond the Deneen study. Uh, she, she strove for uh, nationwide depictions of industrial effects rather than stopping at the boundary of Illinois or New Jersey, as most previous studies had done. Uh, stepping into the role of full-time government investigator, she personally introduced a new level of fusion between medical and nation-state authority uh, the, the, that in Great Britain and Germany had made possible a, a whole national literature, blooming national literature on occupational diseases uh, for a decade or more. She thereby challenged what was a prevailing skepticism about whether the, these results from England and Europe applied to America, and this was another big break. <clears throat> she, uh, applying the same method up to industry after industry, she, she built up a body of evidence about just how widespread and persistent this problem with occupational disease was for American industry. Now, just to give you a clearer sense of what she did, <clears throat> and here's, you know, a little bit of the visuals about what this workplace would look like. Uh, in early May of 1911, she arrived at the Wetherill White Lead Factory this is in Philadelphia with only a notepad in hand. The foreman at this, the country's oldest white lead paint plant, where they made paint, the, the pigment for paint, greeted her and hosted a walking tour. Hamilton noticed how dry dust littered the floors and clouded the air. Despite hoods and blowers for dust collection, the room where workers separated, on, uh, separated out the corroded white lead appeared, quote, excessively dusty. And on the third floor, where they mixed and packed the dried compound for shipment, heaps of white lead stretched from wall to wall. The factory employees, most of them Polish, Hungarian, or Italian immigrants, showed no concern about stirring or breathing the omnipresent dust. The foreman himself, who had worked at the plant for 30 years, found the existing conditions virtually ideal. Though he did admit he, that, that few workers chose to use the res respirators the company, company supplied, he insisted that there was little or no lead poisoning among them. So this was a constant refrain. First time she went into a factory, no lead poisoning here, especially from the higher ups. She kept her suspicions to herself on the visit. She got to walk through, and then later on in the week, she went and checked the records of the local hospital. Uh, and she talked with local doctors, talked with some of the workers that she found out had been poisoned, and was able to document some 27 cases of lead poisoning among Wetherill employees. This is in a, in a plant where there was no, supposedly no lead poisoning at all. And the correlation was good, too, with the dustiest of jobs, where the exposure was the greatest. Now, in the light of later, this, so this was the kind of thing that she did over and over again to accumulate all this uh, uh, body of evidence. In the light of later studies like Landrigan's, <coughs> these methods naturally, they look crude and amateurish. But I think we should be cautious in our judgment here. However these studies may seem to us today, <clears throat> they look quite different to the medical and public health experts of Hamilton's own time. It is remarkable how much medical consent and even acclaim Hamilton was able to achieve at this stage of her career. And she was too, despite her being frustrated with the, uh, what she called the approximate uh, uh, kind of knowledge, approximate nature of, of the evidence that she was gathering. Um, and these are the, this is, the, of course, the, what the uh, disease looked like at the time, the kind of classic picture of lead poisoning at the time, the, the 27 cases, uh, was, uh, was pretty dramatic. And uh, once, you, once you knew what it was, easy to see. Uh, <clears throat> so when in, when in 1918, Harvard's David Edsel sought the most qualified individual in the country to become the nation's first professor of industrial medicine, and they were building a program at Harvard to address this. <clears throat> Who did he turn to? Alice Hamilton. Here's what he said. Her studies stand out as being unquestionably both more extensive and of finer quality than those of anyone else who, had do, who has done work of this kind in this country. <clears throat> you know, in a context for this kind of praise of Hamilton, uh, clinical practices were, for ferreting out this and other diseases, remained largely where Edsel himself had found them. Uh, when he started to, to look into them around the turn of the century. Underpenetrated by the laboratory, hardly any pe people did these blood studies, and largely uninformed by any pre-existing research. <clears throat> Hamilton had some advantages, too, in the diseases she told, which she chose. Lead poisoning by its very definition, pointing back to one particular chemical cause. Um, 
And so, so once you had these, these uh, uh, symptoms like the stomach ache, fatigue, uh, the wrist drop, the blue line on the gums, physicians were convinced that that was lead poisoning. So uh, there was this kind of agreement if you could show those symptoms, even without the lab work. The toxins, the toxin, this toxin that she looked for uh, uh, and the disease that she found combined with the captive laboratory-like nature of the workplace itself uh, to make Hamilton's argument for cause an especially powerful one uh, for the medical community of her time. Now, it's also too important to understand another thing. Uh, of the, this time period, that, it, that Hamilton's primary audience for these studies was only partly a professional community of scientific specialists. And, and you might even argue that one of her chief audiences was actually lay people. And here I'm talking about, you know, she did talk with workers and interviewed workers and, and had some collaboration with unions. But in this day and age, her main target with, with these studies was a white collar audience, and that was the managers who ran the factory she surveyed. Uh, any legal foundation for, for forcing workplace change was lacking. This was a time when even state labor laws, they didn't have compensation, when these ailments were still assumed to be a part of the natural risk that anyone uh, took on in, 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 in accepting work at a particular plant. So she had little choice, really, but to try and catch the eye and ear of corporate owners and employers, to convince them of the private necessity for factory reform. And this became all the more true as she became more skeptical that the laws themselves, compensation, would suffice to detect and remedy the multitudinous problems caused by lead. It was just basically all over the place in, in industries, American industries of its time. Now, of course, a crucial part of Hamilton's strategy was her effort to bring greater awareness of lead poisoning to physicians and to the larger public health community. And that thrust of her work became ever more central uh, when in 1919 she received an appointment uh, at the Harvard School of Public Health uh, uh, right at its beginning. <clears throat> when it was, actually, it was actually devoted at first to industrial health and only later did it become a school of public health. It's kind of interesting, reversal of what you think. Um, <clears throat> so not a decade, not just a, not a decade after Hamilton completed her series of studies at the Bureau of Labor, her methods themselves were in the process of coming to seem far more amateur and lay than before, as industrial hygiene married into the new laboratory and quantitative styles of science. Uh, the remaining untenured at Harvard throughout this decade and beyond, her whole life basically, Hamilton contributed in important ways to these scientific turns of her colleagues. Uh, the extraordinary rapidity with which industrial hygienists embraced numbers and quantification, laboratory experiment, it had a lot to do with contemporary trends in, in uh, medical and, and public health uh, professions of the time. Uh, on the one hand, they were reworking our understanding of industrial ailments like lead poisoning with tools that had already been made bacteriology into a such, such an influ influential science. Uh, on the other hand, they were forging new alliances between analytical chemistry and physiology in the clinic. So there's lots going on in terms of scientific progress uh, in the medical schools like Harvard of the time. And you know, the, 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 this new school of public health and industrial health, uh, they were right at the center of it at the time. They got the funding from the industries for one thing. And Hamilton, uh, Hamilton was a part of that. Uh, so these, this new generation starting in the 20s, uh, forged new means of investigating the links between the industrial environment and disease. Uh, a new cognitive